If you were with us last week, you know that we were tracking a conversation that took place between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Now, that passage of Scripture is in the Bible to reveal to us the true nature of how to obtain right standing before God. And specifically, Jesus deals with the, the fact that it is not through religious involvement, religious participation, activity in religious things, but rather it is through Jesus himself being lifted up as redemption's price that brings to us the opportunity to be right in the sight of God. And so it talks about how to obtain right standing before God. Now John chapter 4 basically builds on that as John is writing this gospel. He's trying to tell us a story and to put pieces in place, if you will, that will be helpful to us as one builds on another. John chapter 4 is presented to help us understand not so much how we may obtain righteousness as much as who may obtain righteousness. And the glorious truth of Scripture is this. Anyone who comes to Jesus, he will in no wise cast them out. So John chapter 4 talks to us about who may obtain right standing before God. And so I want us to read only the first 10 verses of this chapter, John chapter 4 this morning. And we'll cover more than that, so you'll want to keep your Bibles open and handy there because time is going to give us the opportunity today to probably just cover the whole chapter maybe. We'll see. So John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 10. <clears throat> Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Father, I'm asking you this morning to speak to our hearts through your word. This is not an unfamiliar passage of Scripture for most of us. But Lord, the truths that are in it are so profound and so essential for us understanding our mission, our purpose under God as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please speak to us today. Speak to us in power. Speak to us convictionally. Speak to us, uh, Lord, with encouragement to be about that which you have called us as your church to do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the part of this passage that we read and beyond it really does lay out for us something that is very important for us to know. In this encounter that Jesus has with this Samaritan woman that we just now read about, in, in one fell swoop, Jesus enlarges the scope of gospel proclamation and impact beyond any limitation. Now, I want you to hear that again. Jesus enlarges the scope of gospel proclamation and impact beyond any limitation. Right here, he does that. Basically, this encounter that Jesus has with this Samaritan woman, it says there are no limits to the arena of gospel proclamation. There, there's no place that the gospel should not be proclaimed. Not only are there no limits to the arena of gospel proclamation, but there is no limit as to who should hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right here, Jesus does that very thing. 
Now, I'm going to bring you to a verse of Scripture in the book of Hebrews. It's the 7th chapter, the 25th verse, just as a, a reference for you to help you understand that Scripture follows up on this idea. Listen to what it says, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, I'm going to tell you this, and you can write this down if you want to. You can just let it become something that lands in your memory and stays there. You can't get to the end of where uttermost is. I don't know where that is, but I know that you can't get there. Basically, what that verse does is it reaffirms the realization that the scope of gospel impact and proclamation is beyond any limitation that you or I would impose on it. And we do impose limitations on the impact of the gospel, its potential impact, or the proclamation of the gospel. We tend to decide what the gospel can do, who it can impact, who it can affect. And we tend to decide where it should be shared where it should be expressed, where it should be proclaimed. But Jesus here shows us in Scripture, then comes along to reiterate and reemphasize the fact that there are no limits to what Jesus intended the gospel to do or where he intended for it to go. Let's figure out what happens here. In John chapter 4, immediately as this encounter begins to take place, Jesus first plows through the barrier of human prejudice. Understand, please, that Jesus is still in the early part of his ministry. He's made his debut at Jerusalem, if you will. He's, he's come through all these situations where he begins at Cana by this first miracle of turning the water into wine to supply and sustain the wedding guests, the feast at the wedding. Then he moves into that episode where he goes into the temple and he cleans house. I mean, he rambunctiously, energetically cleans house in the temple. And, and this is, by that time, already having a lot of people kind of tracking what he's doing, following him, watching to see what's next, trying to understand just what he's about and who he is. And it also has the religious leadership a little bit antsy and a little bit nervous. And then we have this encounter between he and Nicodemus, which happens to be one of the Pharisees, one of the, the leaders among the Jews. So he comes to kind of feel Jesus out and see who he really is and maybe get a handle on things, maybe try to contain him a little bit. Not sure what the motive is, but they have this conversation about the way to, to obtain true righteousness, that it's not through religious participation. It's through a, a redeeming that occurs when the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus, is lifted up on the cross as redemption's price, and His blood is shed for the sins of all. So, so this is where we then move into John chapter 4. Now, what happens here in this particular instance is that Jesus is prompted to leave that area. Scripture says in the very first part of the chapter that he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Now, if you understand anything about the geography of, of Israel, of that nation, what happens is that you can basically take it, and if it was just a, 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 a piece of land that looked like this, there are three sections to it. The bottom section is where Jerusalem is located, and that's called Judea. The next section is a place right in the center that's called Samaria. And the next place is up at the northern part that's called Galilee. So Jesus was going to leave Jerusalem or Judea and go north to Galilee. Now between Judea and Galilee was Samaria. Samaria was one of those places that Jews didn't really like very much. I, I don't have any real frame of reference to compare it to. But this, this place of this event, this place called Samaria the Jews would often, in fact, try to find ways to bypass this place. They would try to find ways not to go through there because there was this, this innate, this inherent prejudice. And it had to do with everything from uh, the, the way that they viewed life to the, the blood that ran through their veins. And so this place, Samaria, was a place that Jews really didn't like to go to very much or go through very much. And so sometimes they would actually, instead of going straight north from Jerusalem to, to Galilee, they would actually go around to the east and then up by the Jordan River and go all the way up until they came past Samaria and then cut, cut back to the west and then go into Galilee just because they did not like Galilee. I mean, they did not like Samaria or Samaritans at all. 
So Jesus is making his way north to Galilee. And as he does that, he sa- the verse, verse 4 says in, in this Bible, it says that Jesus had a need to go through Samaria. He needed, it was essential. There was a purpose that needed to be accomplished that drove him, that motivated him, that moved him through Samaria. Now, I want to I make a point here for us. What happens here is that Jesus had a destination in mind. He left Jerusalem, he left Judea to go where? Where does your Bible tell you that he's going to go? Galilee. To Galilee. Okay, so he had a destination in mind. Now, many times the Jews, when they had this destination in mind, the direction was just something that was decided based on how to get there the quickest, how to get there without the most confrontation, how to get there without any problems or any situations, how to get there without putting themselves out by going through Samaria. So they had this direction in mind. Now, I want you to understand something with me this morning. The the direction that Jesus would choose to get to his destination ultimately was just important to one person as the destination itself. What do I mean by that? I mean, so many times in our Christian experience, we have these, these places that we seem to be trying to get to spiritually. We, ha- we have these, these goals, I guess, that we're trying to meet. We have this, this knowledge that we're trying to obtain. We have this, this activity that we're trying to participate in. But I want you to know that sometimes just getting to the destination, if we're not careful, we might bypass something in the direction that we choose that God has ordained for us that will make a difference in the life of someone somewhere along the way. And so Jesus chose his direction based on the purposes of God for his life, not just to get to a destination that was out there ahead of him. He chose his direction because there was something important along the way that God wanted to do in his life. Now, every one of us are moving toward destinations. Hopefully, our ultimate destination is eternity and glory with our Heavenly Father. But as we go, we have to choose directions that will take us there. We have to follow a path, and we need to understand that it's along that path that God interjects opportunities for us to be of use to him, for us to take his gospel to the world. It's interesting that sometimes whenever we think about even mission trips, that we, we want to get to the mission field, the place we're going, whether it's, let's just say we're going to Indianapolis or maybe Peru. And we want to get there in order to share the gospel when we get there. But I want you to know something. Every step of that journey, there are lost people along the way. And that doesn't just start when you leave the city limits of Sherman, Texas. They're every step along the way. And so we need to understand that that God leads us in a direction to be involved in his purpose, just like he's taking us to a destination that involves us in his purpose. Don't miss what is along the way trying to get somewhere that that ultimately you're you're going to get to anyway. See what God has for you today. So the place of the event is Samaria. Jesus needed to go through there because there was purpose for him going through there. It was necessary. He realized that there was something he needed to accomplish. There was a divine appointment along the way. There was a larger purpose for his going to Galilee, and that larger purpose was to go through Samaria because there was something that needed to happen. And here's what it is. The purpose really was not just about leading a woman and helping a woman understand what what the, the blessing of faith in him would be to her life. But this encounter with her also had a larger purpose of breaking down walls. Now remember, we're at the early part of Jesus' ministry. And early on, he's talking to this this woman about the gospel. And in that particular moment in time, he's tearing down walls of prejudice, walls of of prevention that would cause someone to bypass an individual with the gospel if he hadn't done this. The person that we're talking about here is called simply a Samaritan woman. Now, if you remember reading back in John chapter 3, the person that Jesus had a conversation with was given a name, Nicodemus. In this case, the woman remains nameless. She does, she's not given a name. She's a Samaritan woman. She's a, a kind of a representative maybe of a, of a larger picture here. 
So as her, as her identity comes to us, it's very clear, very simple. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, Scripture says that they, they were there about the sixth hour, which is noontime, not the typical time to draw water. You've heard the stories. The reason this woman would come to draw water at this particular time was because of her reputation. She was not welcome to be there at the typical time that people would come to draw water. So she came by herself and no one else was there. So she wouldn't have to listen to their insults. She wouldn't have to put up with the, the things that would naturally come to her because of her reputation around town. And so we have here a woman, a person, a Samaritan woman, and someone has identified three negatives about her that would normally present Jesus from even speaking to her. The first negative is that she was female. A Jewish man just didn't go around talking to individual women all the time. It, it was just something that was not considered appropriate. They were alone at a well, and he normally wouldn't have spoken to her. The second thing is she was foreign. She was female and she was foreign. And she was someone that was a Samaritan. Her, their bloodlines were different. Their culture was different. Everything about them was different. So she was, she was a stranger. She was a foreigner. She was someone that he wouldn't just naturally engage in a conversation with. So she was female and she was foreign. And third, she was fallen. She had a, she had a reputation that no one would want. And we learn that later when Jesus tells her, you've had five husbands and the one you're living with now is not your husband. She had a reputation. She was fallen. And so this was someone that Jesus normally just would not have had a conversation with, that a person would not normally have had a conversation with. But Jesus is not a normal person. All of these would have been reasons that he could have avoided her. But here Jesus obliterates these barriers and he strikes up a conversation with this woman. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. If there's any barrier that ever pre prevents you or me from sharing the gospel with anyone, anytime, anywhere, it is a barrier that we ourselves have put up. It's not a barrier that God has structured. Jesus is about tearing down walls. It's about obliterating prejudices. You know, we all have things that, that cause us to want to avoid certain people, don't we? The way they look, the way they live, sometimes maybe even the way they laugh. Something about people, we, we get them in our line of sight and we begin to assess and to evaluate. Is this somebody I really want to associate with? Is this somebody that I really want to talk to? It may be the way they've dressed. It may be the, 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 the work they do. It may be the way they talk. Who knows? But we begin to, to try to make determinations about whether we should or whether we shouldn't associate, whether we should or whether we shouldn't have conversation, whether we should or whether we shouldn't fellowship at some level with these individuals. I want to tell you something. Jesus here destroys all of those predetermined things that we put up, those walls that we erect that would keep us from talking to people about the gospel. And if those barriers exist, it's not because God put them there. It's because we put them there. And we need to, we need to have, a, we, we need to have a, a, a Reagan moment. When he, when he, you remember when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall? We need to have a Reagan moment in our spiritual lives where we quit erecting walls and start destroying the barriers that we've put between ourselves and a world that is hungry for the gospel, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to tear down the walls. We need to understand that Jesus shows us that's what it's all about. So what happens here is he strikes up this conversation with her. Now, the second thing that I want to show you out of this passage of Scripture that is primary is that not only does Jesus come to the place where he actually plows through human prejudice, but the second thing is he faces the reality of human failure. <clears throat> In this instance, as Jesus begins to talk to her, they have this conversation about the water and the well and these sorts of things, and then he begins to talk to her very pointedly about her life. And I want you to see and I want you to understand here that as Jesus tries to help her understand the need for the water that he would bring to her soul, he does not ignore her sin. Sin is not ignored even though the walls are destroyed. It's, it's, not, it's not that there is a wall that comes down where everything is tolerated. 
It's, a, it's that there's a wall that comes down that, prevent, that, that has prevented association or discussion or conversation or proclamation. And once that proclamation occurs, sin is not ignored. Her failure, her flaws were not simply overlooked by the Lord Jesus. He didn't dismiss those out of hand and say that they were not a part or not important in her life. They were something that were, was a part of who she was. And so it had to be dealt with. Now, most, most people, if they'd looked at her life, they would have said, yeah, she's a sinner. She's beyond hope. She's beyond help. She's done so much. She's been so horrible. She's been so wicked and so evil that there's no hope and no help for her. But I'm here to say to you this morning that Jesus faces the reality of her human failure, her flaws, her, her, her fallenness. But he doesn't let that make him push her out of the scope of gospel impact. Okay? So, so as, he, as he begins to share with her about her life, we see that he begin, continues to invite her and include her in what he desires to happen in her life as the gospel settles in upon her. And that is that he views her not simply, boy, I don't know where that came from. It woke me up. Maybe I hope it did you too. But as, as her sin was not ignored, that the, the fact of her sin did not ever mean to Jesus that she was not a soul that was treasured by God. She was treasured by God. Every soul on this planet is treasured by God. Jesus cared for this broken woman, and he made her an offer. He said to her, listen, you need to understand that if you listen to me, you, I'm asking you for a drink of water because my body is tired and weary, but I know as I look into your soul that there's an emptiness, there's a, a destitution, there's a parched soul inside of you that needs the water that I can bring, and that is the redemptive work of the Son of Man being lifted up on the cross to pay the price and redeem you from your sin and transform your life by grace. And the water that I give you, if you take it, you'll never thirst again. That was the offering of Jesus. In 1981, there's a place in Jenison, Michigan called Ida's Pastry Shop. This was the offer that they made as their special. Buy one of our coffee mugs for $4.79 and fill your cup up for a dime every time you visit. The owners thought, you know, we'll sell all these cups and we'll make all this money, and they probably did, but they didn't take into account four men who loved to drink coffee that lived in the neighborhood. More than 25 years later, these four men were still coming in with their mug every day. They had found the well that did not run dry. <laughs> we have a Dairy Queen bunch like that over on Sunset. I know, I, the well that never runs dry. As Jesus offered the water, the living water, the woman kind of sarcastically said to him, Sir, the well, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? The, the well was deep. In fact, it, in actual measurement, has shown it to be about 75 feet deep and about 9 feet in diameter. In 1842, there was an, a, a guy who did excavations, and he sent uh, a man down on a rope, a Jew named Jacob, to explore the well. And actually, he knew that there was a friend of his, a, a Reverend Mr. Bonar, who had been through there three years before, who had dropped his Bible in that well accidentally. And so he sent him down to see if he could retrieve it. Well, the Bible was found. It was almost destroyed by the water that was in there. And so you think about this well in 1842, whenever it was explored, and I'm sure it's been uh, explored since then, but this story is about a Bible that fell into that water, and the Bible was almost destroyed by that water. And you think of the long series of, of people, of a hundred nations and a thousand generations that have come by that well and drunk of its waters. And no matter how much they would drink, no matter how much they would take in from that well, at some point, they would be thirsty again. And Jesus comes to this Samaritan woman, and he says, the water that you give, it, its effect perishes, its effect wanes, but I'm here to offer you something that will make your life different now and forever. And so... We see by her life, by her example, that the gospel is beyond limitation. It goes beyond the worst, most heinous sin that could be committed. And so we have a woman here who pictures for us a person that is as fallen as you can be. 
She's foreign and she's female. And Jesus destroys those barriers and says to her, the gospel works for you too. The saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will work in your life too. By the way, if you're here this morning and, and, and you're thinking, you know, I'm, I know I'm a sinner and I know I've done some rotten things. I know that my life is terrible. I'm wicked. Thank you for being honest. I, I, I volunteer to stand beside you because that's my heart too. Scripture says about all of us that our hearts are desperately wicked. And it doesn't matter what your sin looks like. It doesn't matter what your failures are shaped like. I want you to understand this morning that the gospel is for you. The saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiving mercy of Christ as he pleaded for forgiveness of men from the cross is for you today. Jesus died for you. And your sin doesn't prevent, it doesn't eliminate you from the equation of God's gospel grace. It doesn't exempt you from his ability to save. His grace is for you. So Jesus faces the fact of human failure. He does something else as this passage continues. Uh, again, remember I've told you how he confronts her in her fallenness. And she immediately begins to talk about something else. She's talked about water. Now they've talked about her family and her, her failures, her flaws. And then the woman said in verse 19, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Can, can, you, just, can you just see her grasping for some way to get off the subject that they've been talking about? They've been talking about her sin. Who wants to talk about our sin? Nobody does. And so she says, kind of maybe a little bit sarcastically, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Yeah, you're able to look into my life and Tell me everything there is about me. Then she turns the subject to religion. This is what she says. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. What's she saying? She's saying that, you know, this is something that everybody kind of has to work out for themselves. You worship one way, we worship another. You worship one place, we worship another place. It, it's really all about who you are. It's all about your personality. It's all about what you like or don't like. It's about your preferences. It's about all these different things. And so she begins to talk to Jesus about this, this worship idea. You know, I understand that you believe one thing one way, but you've got to understand that I believe what I believe the way I believe it. And, and, and it has a lot to do maybe with how I was brought up, where I've lived, the things I've heard, the things I've been taught. And so Jesus, as he has already talked to her about her failure, as he's already obliterated these barriers, this prejudice that exists, now he refutes the fallacy of ritualistic devotion to God. As he's trying to bring this woman into a relationship with God through himself, he refutes the fallacy of ritualistic devotion. What he says to her essentially is this. You need to understand what worship really is. If you, if you think for one minute that worship is about a place you go or about a, a ritual that you perform, then you need to understand what worship really is because that ain't it. And I know that's not good English, but it's good preaching. Okay. What, what is he trying to say to her? What is he trying to teach her? What is he trying to tell her? He's trying to tell her that the, the, there needs to be a correction of the misconception that worship is determined by personal preferences. That, that, that how we worship or what we worship or what we do or what we say, how we think worship unfolds is determined by us. Who do we think we are to decide what worship is or is not? The fallacy leads us to believe misconceptionally, that worship is according to what I prefer. How many times in the 30-plus years that I've been doing this have I heard somebody say, well, I'm choosing this church because I like the way they do it. It fits me. It suits me. What about God? Does it suit God? Because worship is not about me. And hello, it's not about you either. Okay? It's about God. It's about our approach to God. It's not about what I prefer, what I like, what I desire, what makes me warm and fuzzy. By the way, if worship doesn't make you a little bit uncomfortable, 
you probably haven't worshiped because worship is coming into the presence of someone who is so holy, so righteous, so awesome and so powerful. The scripture says that on occasion, whenever people came into the presence of this God, they fell on their faces as if they were dead. It's not about us, folks. And, And Jesus is very clear in trying to help this woman understand that worship is not about what I prefer, what I enjoy. <laughs> enjoy? Man, I want to be stirred. I want to be moved. I want to be profoundly impacted. I want to be overwhelmed. I want to be at a place where I lose control. Boy, that's hard for us to say, isn't it? And the stoic people of God came to the church one more time. Right? Come on, let's, let's say amen because it's true. All right, we know that. Let's let God in. Let's let him do what he's brought us here to do. This, this idea that worship is about a place or a process, it's amazing what we get hung up on when it comes to worshiping God. Well, I didn't like the song that we sang today. I didn't like the way they played that music. Well, that prayer that he prayed was way too long. Come on. This is not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. And so Jesus basically says to this woman, you need to believe me. You need to hear me. When I say to you the hour is coming that we'll neither worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem, that worship is much more than that. It's much broader than just about a place to go. He says, the hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking such to worship Him. I don't want to be the kind of person that seeks a place to worship. I want to be the kind of worshiper that God is seeking to worship Him. Because then I've gotten biblical. I've gotten right. And so he tells us here that the measure of authentic worship is not determined by preference, but it is determined by the level of our honest, transparent self-presentation before a holy and a righteous God. The gospel truth takes us beyond ritual. It takes us beyond preference. It takes us to a place where we get gut level honest with God. We come to the place where we open our souls and we say to the one who owns our souls, the one who feeds our souls, we're here for you, God. We're here for you to look inside of us as deeply as you desire and to to move in me, to change me, to transform me, to make me what you want me to be. There was a man whose name is Brother Lawrence and He wrote a lot about worship, about solitude and quietness in the presence of God. He asked this question. He says, what man shall there be, however small the reason he may have, who will not use all of his strength to render to this great God of ours his reverence and worship? In other words, we come to the place where it's not about us. The gospel truth takes us beyond the ritual. It takes us beyond the activity. So, Jesus moves into this place called Samaria by necessity. It's necessary for me to go there. Where is God necessarily wanting to lead you? Uh, One guy said this. He says, I've learned much more from the things I had to do than from the things I've chosen to do. What does God want you to do that you've kind of said to him, I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Where has God tried to take you? Where has God tried to place you? How has God tried to use you? Where you've said to him, you know, that's not in my comfort zone, God. You know, I'm pretty sure the cross was not in the comfort zone of of Jesus either. Where does God want to take you? How does he want to use you? Three things I want to leave you with here this morning. First of all, Conformity to a man-made standard should never determine the look of the body of Christ. Jesus comes along and everything that men had said religion ought to look like, he just flies right in the face of it. And he brings it crashing to the ground. You and I 
do not get to decide what the church, the body of Christ looks like. It ought to look like everybody. Whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're dark-skinned or light-skinned, whether they're broken to pieces by the, the ravages of sin or whether they've been one of these fortunate people that have just lived a pretty clean life forever. The church ought to look like all of that and then some. We do not get to make the standard. Jesus does. Secondly, we need to understand this, and we need to preach this from the mountaintops. Those who have failed are not losers. They're just lost. Folks, they're treasures to God, just like you are and just like I was and them. They're, they're souls that are separated. They're souls that are parched and empty, that need the living water that comes from the well of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Conformity to a man-made standard does not determine the look of a church. Those who failed are not losers. They're just lost. Third, worship is not something that we design. Rather, it occurs when we resign our lives and surrender to God. A lot of people looking for this living water. A lot of people are dry and thirsty. A lot of people are empty. A lot of people are tired in their souls. And they need Jesus. And just like the man that Jesus raised from the dead, you and I have been quickened, brought to life by the Holy Spirit of the living God, and we have a story to tell. We know the one who can bring this reality to their lives. The United States has spent millions of dollars looking for water in all kinds of places. Can you believe they spent millions of dollars looking for water on the planet Mars? Did you know that? A few years ago, NASA sent twin robots, their names, Opportunity and Spirit, to this red planet to see if water was present or had been present at one time. Why did they do this? Well, they're trying to pour over the data that was sent back from those Martian rovers, trying to figure out if life had ever existed on Mars. And the reason that that's important is because they know this. For, for that to have happened, there had to be water, because where there's no water, there's no life. Jesus said, he that drinks from the water that I give him will never thirst again. 2,000 years ago, a, a couple of rovers set out across the countryside of an earth outpost called Samaria looking for water. One, Jesus, was looking for physical water to sustain his wearied body. One was a woman who lived by him. And they ended up meeting together at this well of a village called Sychar. And when they did this, Jesus had found the water that he needed, but the woman found the water that she did not know she needed until she met Jesus. Jesus is just as real and capable of bringing to your soul today the life that he brought to that woman. 2,000 years ago. 